Uh, I was reading a bit about everything that uh, you do at Heroes, that you're the founder and executive director of Heroes and how the whole program that has been running now for 25 years was, I think if I'm not wrong, it was born uh, a bit earlier than me in 1995. <laughs> <And> yes. <laughs> a couple of years earlier. Um, I was reading about your, ne- uh, your intention and your necessity regarding the program, that it was born out of necessity for you. Yes. And in the deep south, um, you uh, you were in this, um, while I was reading, you were saying that uh, any program would uh, be uh, 45 to an hour away. Um, it was very far and will keep women out of the conversation regarding HIV, especially black uh, heterosexual women that, Yes. Uh, that could not take part. Is there any, um, how was the environment back then? Is there any specific reason um, together with sexism and uh, no um, sexual or emotional education available in schools that would prevent women to have access to the program? Is there, say, say it one more time. I'm sorry. Is there, um, was only the sexism that would prevent women to have access to the program because uh, they would be the information will be gate gate capped and or is that um, uh, how like how hard was for women to find a support group back before heroes and why they will be so excluded from the HIV conversation that would mainly include men. Well, primarily the reason why there were uh, no women was because, uh, one, we didn't know about the group. And then two, because of stigma, because back then, early on, you know, this was supposedly a gay white man's disease. So the, the, the Black ladies that I knew actually excluded themselves, a lot of them, because it's like, oh, well, that's not me, because, you know, they just, they they didn't want to recognize that their their diagnosis at the time. <laughs> so a lot of information. They would gatekeep a lot of information and resources. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And was it how was at the beginning? How was the founding of Until as an experience for you? I read that it was you struggled with um, financing the whole project and it was defunded later on. And, and well, luckily volunteers came along and it was uh, yeah. restored. And especially about your necessity well, we, for, for, your, for your child to have a safe environment to grow in. Yes, well, we actually started with volunteers. When we started, we didn't have money. I actually just saw a need I contacted some friends and I tried to eliminate all the reasons why I could say I can't come to a support group. So one was I don't have transportation because we are a a very rural area Mm -hmm. and it's a large geographical area. So some it takes me about 30, 45 minutes to get to the spot. But for some clients, it could take up to an hour and a half. So. It, I tried to eliminate reasons why they couldn't come. So transportation was was a reason then. It's still a reason now. Then childcare. If they had kids, young kids at home, then they couldn't come. And um, I just wanted to make sure they could get there. They we provided the food. We provided tra- we provided transportation. We provided childcare once they got there. And then for me personally, I like to eat, and I think that just opens up stuff so every we always ate <laughs> that's that's great food really can bring people along yeah especially i was very impressed by the child care um possibility and option because of course as a 20 something year old i never thought about that but i can think for working parents and for working mothers how hard it will be to have access to a group that maybe they cannot afford uh, a babysitting or child care or some somebody yes. that will take care of the kids. I think that now community and community building is something that we're slowly losing and it's a shame because I think in the past, like my mom or my my grandma will ask maybe my aunt or a friend of the family to take care of me or my mom when she was a child. And now we're completely lost 
uh, we're very isolated. We're more like even more yeah. isolated than before. Mm -hmm. um, this brings me a little bit to my second question. Um, we worked with realities that were, for example, in Atlanta. So a completely different South reality, a completely different South area, very less rural, um, more connected. How, like, what are the challenges that now as a nonprofit in the rural South you're facing, especially after the COVID pandemic? Well, it was, it's always been funding for us. Funding has always been the, the catalyst that keeps us going forward. And even when we've lost funding, I have, um, I have asked for donations for people because there are a couple of programs like our dream retreat and our HIV support group that I just don't think I can let go. So even if we, you know, all of our other programs stopped, we kept those two programs going because they're so important to me. And I think they're important to the people that uh, have access to them. Because what I did find out was one time we lost funding and I was just waiting for the next grant to apply and everything happened. That once you, um, once the funding was lost and the people didn't have that consistency of meeting every week, every other week, whenever it was, then when you got started back, it was hard to get them reengaged. So those are two things that we just don't stop. We just, you know, we just learned how to uh, do it on a water budget. <laughs> luckily, luckily there are volunteers and there are people who can uh, can come in hand, that can help when the when projects get defunded. Um, yeah. Is it... Um, I read a lot about the intersection between the um, high pregnancy rate in the South, the lack of sex education, the lack of resources available, and projects like yours that try to make a difference and, and see when these projects are not there, there is the spike again of teen pregnancy and there is the spike again of yes. uh, children dropping out of school. And basically it's a government still don't get it and still probably neglect very much of this reality in the South. Um, but can we talk more, especially as a 20 year old in, still in school, um, I'm still in university, I'm doing my master's. Um, I'm very into the, uh, how can we keep um, young women and young men in school in safe protected areas? Because you said that you founded the heroes also to have a safe space for your child to move around, to grow up in, and yeah. to prevent drop dropping high, high like high school dropout rates and high school and then and everything. So it's very interesting uh, this intergenerational in aspect that involves so many. It involves in, in, hidden homelessness. It involves uh, high teen pregnancy rates. Yeah. Uh Fortunately, one thing we don't see a lot in our parish, just because we're so small. Now, I know we do have homelessness, but it's just harder to spot here than it is like we don't have people sleeping under the bridges and uh, downtown because our downtown probably is not like a half a block or something of one of y'all blocks. It's that, and that's our whole downtown. But but what we did, what I did see was that um, a lot of kids, well, back when my son was in school, I know that a lot of kids just hung out a lot. And when we started the after school program and the kid, we, kid, we held the kids accountable. So they knew that if they got in trouble, if they did anything at school, and we talked about teen pregnancy prevention all the time, we had a contract with them and their parents that we were going to be talking about real issues, sex ed and all that stuff, stuff they weren't getting at school. And we had condoms displayed around the upper classroom so they had access and nobody had to see them, no, no adult had to see them getting them. Then I was going to hold, not just me, the whole staff, we were going to hold them accountable. So 
I think when kids and kids like structure, although they act like they don't, they really do like structure. They like to know that somebody's looking out for them. They like to know because all our kids knew because a lot of the parents here were not involved in the school systems like they didn't. Uh, go to the plays or do stuff in the school system, not the school board meetings, anything. And we showed up just because we wanted them to know. And when things start happening at school, one of the things we taught our kids was how to be proactive instead of reactive. So if you see something about to happen, we're going to see what we can do. So, you know, because sometimes, again, where we live, it's not always culturally competent here. They People like to think they're culturally competent, but they're not. So, and then even when you bring it to their attention, it still doesn't matter a lot, but you still, I think it's important to bring it to their attention. So we would teach them like what they needed to do, how they needed to do it respectfully in the school system, because um, we just, I just saw a lot of disparities within the system. Because my at that time, my son had got to high school, and I'm so thankful he's not there now, Lord. But uh, <laughs> but because it's still some of the same things happening over and over and over again. You know, we have 30% of African-American kids in the high school, and usually on even getting, any given Sunday or any given Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that if they're kids in detention or kids in in-house uh, in-house detention at school, it'll be my the majority of them are black. And so several years ago, several when my son was in school, I asked uh, the principal then, "Do you think that the black kids are that much worse than the white kids, or do you think the white teachers, because we only had like two black teachers there, have a higher a higher tolerance for what the black kid white kids did? Because my son and his friends and the people in our program used to come home and tell us how the white kids talked to the teachers, what all the things they did, and nothing happened. <laughs> so it was just it's and it's some of the same stuff, you know, that people just don't realize. And, and the kids see it. That's what they don't want to give the kids credit for having to see, okay, you're treating them different than you're treating me. You're treating, the, and the kids see it and they, it just goes over their head. <laughs> mm -hmm. Totally. This double standard. Um, yes. It's really unacceptable. Yeah. It is. Mm, is this, um, I was very, um, I, I can totally understand how hard it, it will be um, to see this double standard in action. Of course, I, I could never imagine how it will be to lack of representation um, in the in the teaching body. As a as you said, you only the the school only had two uh, black teachers, and you had the thirty percent of African American students. And this totally isn't like this. Not this is not representative of maybe um, there for the students that will maybe go into higher education, they will aim to become professors because they don't see mm -hmm. themselves on the other mm -hmm. side of the desk. Exactly. They don't see them, themselves displayed. Um, is, it, is there also, because um, I, I read uh, so many of your programs that you do, it's very, they're very nice. Um, I know that in the States, it's very, like there is a very competitive culture at school and even later in higher education. And for children that are born in rural uh, Southern areas, this could be a problem, especially when it comes to the, um, and, oh, you know, the, the kind of myth of having two parents at home, uh, kind of household, perfect household, 2.5 child mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and everything. Um, they could lack, they, they lack representation. And do you, in your program, do you feel like the, the kids and the children and the young men and women are getting forward, are getting steps forward when it comes to having access to, um, not only as you, as you said, because you make a great job with uh, sexual and, and emotional um, education and health, but also to having, to bringing them new prospects for the future because I, I can imagine, because I'm not, of course, um, no? I don't think so. I don't think so. And and I think that uh, with COVID, 
it has really put a damper on things because when COVID hit, our, our school system was not prepared for it. And it's painful. As painful as that was, I think if they had to go back into lockdown now, I don't know if they would still be ready for it now because the teachers weren't wasn't accustomed to doing the Zoom classes and all that. So, and then even if the teachers did get on, then um, there was my godchild was doing virtual classes and she was at my house and I seen how those classes went and it was it was just to me as a person who's gonna make sure she has everything she needs. But I know all parents, like a lot of parents didn't have access to internet. Mm -hmm. They didn't have access to the Wi-Fi. So, and they didn't have computers at home before the school issued the Chromebook. So, you know, the kids just got left farther and farther behind. And unfortunately, we have not been able to get them like re-caught up. And then the ones who are caught up, I, I'm just, they have programs now that are designed at school. And I think they design them and they don't, and they don't even realize they're not being culturally competent. They, that's the sad thing. Mm-hmm. They don't even realize that this might not be right because th- unfortunately I live, I live in the rural South and I know where I live and I love where I live, but it's always a reality check for me. Right. When you think you've made two steps forward, you found out you are still back where you are. Mm-hmm. And I, it's it's just sad for me to um to know that the kid kids the black kids don't have the, they're not afforded the same opportunity as everybody else not because they can't do it not because they don't they don't have the knowledge it's because their skin color keeps the people who are looking at them for, from even allowing them the access mm-hmm. so it is just and I, and I see that today still and it's sad. So we are um, we're actively working trying to get our after school program back up and running. Mm-hmm. It's just been a hard feat. <laughs> yeah. And for the parents, like switching completely topic, but not not that much. What are the main challenges for the parents that are involved in heroes in support groups regarding the HIV conversation? What are the challenges that they are facing right now? post-COVID and and being, of course, part of the HIV community? Well, we we actually, one of the things that we started doing, we, we, Heroes uh, office caught on fire right before COVID. So we was already, I was already working from home. So this was convenient for me. (laughs) But one of the things that I know that we had, we talked about on our Zoom call Monday was a lot of people are still feeling alone. And they're getting depressed. And, you know, with the recent suicides that had been in the news early in the month and late last month, a lot of them just started rehashing those feelings. And so we always let them decide what topics we're going to talk about. So for each week and for the last two meetings, the meetings we've had in February, they were centered around like depression and loneliness and ways to combat it, things you can do, you know. Loneliness is still, and then everything, every, everything is gone up here. The prices have just went way up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, food has been a challenge. And last year when, well, when COVID first hit, I had a board member who donated um, to, she, well, all my board members donate, but this one board member, I have, I have a system that we, uh, we call buyback. And what we do is, is we, because I realized early on, even before COVID that, you know, a lot of people, the people who have a lot of money, they give out door prizes. When people come to group, they had little gimmicks. We couldn't afford to do that. (laughs) So we started this program called Buyback. And what we do is for everything that I ask you to do, I give you heroes money. Some money I made up on the computer useless to anybody else, but to the clients, um, 
it's a lot. So if I ask, I mean, if you call in for your Zoom, you get paid. For everything you do, you get paid. And then once a year, we have buy, a buyback, a buyback, and it's usually centered around Christmas. And I usually ask all the clients for a wish list. And so we try to get each client a, a item off their wish list. And then we just have other household items and things we've had donated that they can come in and they can shop. But the only way you can shop is with heroes money. So my clients are real serious about their heroes money. I will be too. I get it. I get it. It's great. It's a great way to keep them motivated and to not let them feel like they're alone. They're still part of something bigger. So early when COVID first hit, one of my board members gave a $25 gift cards once a month. So the how you received that was if you call if, for every week you call in to check in, because the other thing, it's like me and one other person volunteering to help me. So we can't, I can't do everything. So we have, I have check-ins. So they would have to call and check in once a week. If they called in every week during the month. At the end of the month, they got the they got all of their heroes money regardless, however many times they called in, and then any extra stuff they done. And if they called in every week, they also got a twenty five dollar gift card that they could use at like Walmart or one of the grocery stores or something. Right. So that was a hit, but unfortunately, that ran out too in December. So, but they're still calling and check in because last year we were able to have, we we had a face-to-face buyback. The year before in 2020, we were unable to have buyback. So a lot, we, and we also got a, a lot of new clients doing COVID, which was surprising to me, but we got a lot of new clients. The people who knew other people were talking to them. And so we got new clients and they had never experienced buyback, but they got to come last year and so in 2021, we had a face-to-face buyback. And so everybody is just like, they own their call-ins, their check-ins, because they want the money. Yeah, that is great. Still a way of community building in the South. Yeah. We talked about, especially regarding rural areas, we talked about hidden homelessness, as we defined it a bit earlier. Mm-hmm. Um I was, of course, the first picture that comes to my mind is uh, how different it is, um, for example, in Los Angeles, the fam- like the infamous Skid Row and, and how is different uh, homelessness in rural areas than in like the big, the big metropolis. Um, one other, um, what are the main, we also talked about um, sexual and emotional health and education that are still lacking. Is it? Um, do you feel like there is a difference between the rural areas in the South and the bigger cities in the South? Because we worked with a lot of realities. Without a doubt, because if I, t- if I, when I, when I traveled and even a lot of stuff, a lot of people don't even know we like this part of the United States even exists. Or they act like they don't know because uh, a couple of examples. If I say I'm from Louisiana, everybody automatically, oh, I love New Orleans. Well, oh. I live five hours from New Orleans, and it's a very different world here <laughs> where I live. I can, I mean, it's it's just a very different world. I mean, we're very rural. Uh, this past weekend, I had uh, a friend, a person come in from D.C., and they had never been here before, and they came down to do a photo shoot with me. And they took a lift from Monroe, which is the big city, to Columbia. They didn't realize till they got down here that Lyft is in Monroe, but we don't have public transportation here. Lyft wouldn't come back and pick them up. Oh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so it was like, she was like, I, I just didn't know. And so I was like, I understand, you know, because I know, and I told her before she got here, I'm like, well, when you get ready to get here, call when you get close, because if you put in my address for Google Maps, Google Maps is not going to bring you to my house. It's going to take you down the street. And she was like, no, surely not. Not 20. To, I'm like, yeah, it's going to take you down the street to an empty field. So oh God, I can relate so bad. <laughs> like, is it weird? So people, okay. people just don't realize this part of the United States exists, and the ones that do, um, 
you know, like several, for several years, I tried to get, um, I met several celebrities at the United States Conference on AIDS, which is sponsored by NMAC. I met several, I met several celebrities there. And when I talked to them and try to engage them about coming here to do a fundraiser, most of them, the, they, they'll, they'll come to Louisiana, but they want to go to New Orleans, Baton Rouge, but that's not going to help me. And they'll say Monroe is the big city. And there's about maybe 150, 200,000 people there. And they'll be like, well, that market is too small. So are you really wanting to help me or is this to help you? I'm not, I've not had uh, the success the success that like larger organizations in Louisiana that I know they'll have a fundraiser and raise a hundred thousand dollars in a night. If we have a fundraiser, I think the most we've ever raised was three thousand dollars, and that's after a lot of work. The one person that so it's a whole different monster. And people, we're here, and I have wrote and talked. I've not talked to, but I have wrote every. Black celebrity that there is, and white ones. When they people from Louisiana, I looked for famous people from Louisiana. So, like Ellen De DeGeneres is from Louisiana, wow. and there are so many people that are from here. And I wrote all of them, and it's like, may I don't maybe they don't see it. Maybe it's just you know the, it goes to their people, and their people decide what they get to see. But we've never had anybody to. Uh, like reach back out to us and we wrote a lot I have wrote not we I have wrote a lot of people <laughs> mm -hmm. I of, of course I'm not from the U.S. I'm not in the U.S. but on a similar international note I am also from the south from a, oh, I'm you? from a big city I'm, I'm Italian I'm in Switzerland right now um but I'm also from the South and our smaller cities, the one that really have 8,000 to 10,000 people there, uh, cows included and, and animals <laughs> included, um, they always get overlooked. And like the people don't really see the, um, the if you ask them to just go there um, and experience what daily life is there and what the resources are there, that they just assume that there isn't like, they it, yeah. they automatically say oh why should I go there it's like there's nothing to see and yeah and it, exactly it's, it's life changing when you put yourself in the shoes of the people that have been raised there and then grew up there um, on how, how how everything implies at least a car and several hours if not one hour <laughs> minimum just to have um, we we talk a lot about food deserts especially in the in the U S and how it's everything to it's it's hard to have access to food that is not that is healthy but it's not expensive and and yes. medical treatment and i was reading that one of the um, one of the people that you helped she had trouble for two months of getting her medications because of covid and covid will prevent all the associations to function properly and and you and it will just spread out the problems even more and just isolate the people even more so it totally, yeah. even though we're on two completely different sides of the world, um, the South is always the South. This also involves a lot of stigma and a lot of oh, lots um, of stigma. a lot of silence, which is even are you even are you in, are you in Switzerland now? Yeah. Oh, what part? I can show you the mountains from here. They're very pretty. <laughs> uh, I'm in the Italian part. I'm okay. in Lugano. I came to Switzerland so years and years ago. Oh, yes, it is. I remember. It I came like to Geneva for a conference Ooh. about 20 years, 30 years ago, probably. Well, maybe 25 years ago, I came to Geneva for an international AIDS conference. Sure. And it was wonderful. <laughs> Geneva is amazing. I yeah. worked there. It was, it's really beautiful. So expensive, <laughs> but it's really beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, people don't get it when they, because they, they just are, um, and then all the resources, unfortunately, does go to the larger cities. They have, like, there are multiple support groups for everybody that's down in the south, in south Louisiana. But up here, the organization that has the uh, Ryan White funding, they have one support group, and it's the Gay Men Wellness Group. Mm -hmm. So, 
again, I'm excluded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is 2022. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It, it's even, yeah. It's been terrible. So it's the same stuff that I went through in 1993, 1992, 91, just, you know, different year. <laughs> we were talking about also the silence, which is an element that I found. I, I, I lived in the South from when I was, from what, when I was born until I was 17, 18 and the stigma around sex education and an emotional health, emotional education and the conversation regarding HIV, the stigma, the silence, the, how the problem gets overlooked. It's a huge part of the, um, the difficult, like the, it, it builds up the problem even more. It makes it even harder for people to, to have access to treatment and, and therapy and, and resources. Um, so I can imagine in rural areas how this element of, of silence and and stigma is even like um, there, as you said, before Heroes, there wasn't any safe space that would give me the opportunity to speak out and talk about my issues and start changing mm-hmm. the reality. Do you feel like now safe spaces are, thanks to your work, are slowly arising or, and are they expanding? No. I don't think they're rising. And and then the ones that were there since COVID has shut down and, you know, stigma is still very prominent here. A lot of people still don't, they're not educated about HIV and AIDS and they're, it's not because there's a lack, lack, lack of education. They just, even the ones that it, when the information is readily available to them, they choose not to access it. They choose not to know. So uh, it's stigma is real, real here still. And um, unfortunately, a lot of people are okay with it. You know, just keeping their head in the sand. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm, yeah. Um, it's very unfortunate because uh, silent generations uh, raise silent yeah. generations. In even in in my generation, it's not a topic that gets discussed often, which is unbelievable since we're in 2022. Yeah, it's like now the people who are the young people. I have a lot of young people in my circle. Now all the young people in my circle talk about. Uh, well, it's not a topic that we just bring up, but if something happens, like one of the young ladies who's in our, um, who was in our after school program starting in second, third grade. Now she is in um, dental hygiene school. So she studies with, she's coming to my house and studies at night. And she, uh, she'll tell me, she said, we talk, uh, we've been talking a lot about HIV lately. And I was so excited because she knew all the answers when they were, were asking like, what are cheese sales and what is this? And, and she was like, and I, yeah. <laughs> so she was excited because she knew, but she was she has 30 something people in her class. And so she knew she was the only one. Yeah. But the other ones didn't. <laughs> oh, when it comes to but if they did know, I'm not gonna say they didn't know. If they did know, they mm-hmm. wouldn't raise their hand and say they knew because still again the stigma is so real. People think, okay, if I say I know this, they gonna people gonna ask me why. <laughs> How do you know this? And so the stigma is real. Which is tremendous thinking about these are future health professionals. These are future exactly. doctors. These are future dentists and future technicians. And there is still so much stigma that prevents them to get an holistic approach to everything. What comes, what comes together with the diagnosis? Like what, what is together? Like comes to the psychological counseling, the support, the family support, the um, and, and everything with that is not strictly scientific. I think there is still lacking an overall approach to consider somebody more than just what you're just told them, more, more than their blood test, more their... Yes, than yes, their yes. And that's one of the things that I really think that Heroes has done well approaching. We've always tried to do a holistic approach because I know in the beginning... When I started, when we first started our support group, it was just for women. And the, because I saw a lack of services for me. So I was like, I know other women 
because I'm very outspoken. Other women are not going to do what I do to make sure they have access. So we had women that would come to the uh, that would come into the group, and it was just amazing to me how the difference in like their attitudes and how they were just whatever they were told, it was okay. Mm-hmm. If they said, you know, well, you can't, you can't do this. And if you tell me I can't do something, I want to know why, because, you know, I always tell people, you know, they put a man on the moon. So I really need to understand why this can't happen. Whatever it is, I know, I just think it can be done, but a lot of people aren't, aren't like that. So if you, t- I had a client one time who was, this was years ago, was on one of the HIV meds that actually caused bring a failure. And I kept telling her when I found out, when I found out she was about to be put on dialysis, I like, they need to change your meds. You need to come off of that medicine and get on another regimen. I kept telling her, her doctors told her no, that that was the best thing for her. She ended up dying before she was 30 mm-hmm. because the doctors told her no. And she didn't know that she could say, well, I don't want to take this. She didn't. And what she did know, but she didn't feel empowered enough to say, well, I'm not going to take this. I don't want to take this. So give me something else. <laughs> oh, I, because it, it makes me hangry. Like it really makes me furious because they, these are the people that we're supposed to trust, right? These are the people that, yes. that are there when they tell us um, this is what's going to happen or this is going to hurt. Yeah. And if you can't trust them, what, what are you supposed to trust? Should I get an, like an MD only because I can't trust you and I'd have to research for myself? Like, I really wish in the future that more healthcare professionals, um, they, they, they get, um, that they, their education provides a more holistic approach that also involves yeah. trust and psychology and, and what that is what does it mean care in all of its forms and and why should you always like because i'm always like the um the tremendous one in in doctor's appointments i'm always asking questions i've I've, I've been called outspoken for that i've been called all the things for that Uh, but they like to know like they they like to understand that this is our body and we are the ones that are dealing with them and especially if i I imagine because of course i know i don't know but imagine that for the black and and african-american community uh, having a so westernized science that it's so based on the white heterosexual cis men, um, it's so hard to get doctors. The luckily that there are um, there are raising the numbers. Like there are even like there are always more uh, African American surgeons and experts and professionals. Luckily, but I feel mm-hmm. like Western medicine. That's also we talk, something that we talked in our last interview. Um, makes it really hard for black women to come out and talk about their problems and talk about their difficulties. Yeah. And again, I, let me go back to when I was talking about, cause I, I, I diverted um, the, when we, when I say I was, I thought one of the things we did well was the holistic approach because I know early on when people would get an HIV diagnosis, you know, it was no, it was just like, okay, you have HIV. And then the only thing they could think of is I'm going to die because this is a death sentence. There was no like now we have pre counseling, pre test counseling, post test counseling, you know, and we got, we'll link you to services right away as soon as possible. But then it wasn't like that. And I knew women who were basically, by the definition, homeless, they were sleeping on somebody else's couch. So I say, we have a lot of homelessness here. It just doesn't look the same. People just go from house to house to house until they can't anymore. And we have a couple of people who sleep in, uh, who've taken up residence on property that's not theirs, like in the tent or something. But for the most part, people, um, the, the, wom- the woman who they've just given this diagnosis to, all oh, they're, they're saying is you need to do this. You need to, and everything is centered around HIV. You got to take your meds. You got to know the T cells. You got to know this. And you got to take your da, 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 da. But all she's thinking while they're talking, my light's going to get cut off tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I can't hear what this man is saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I guess. <laughs> and so people just didn't, they don't, they didn't, some of them still don't get it. But that's one of the things that we, we have, we have really tried to, I always approach people you know, I try to I try to meet everybody where they are. 
because you have to realize everybody's not the same place. And then once you get to, when you meet them where they are, then you need to see how you can move them forward to get them to a better place. Because I, even I, I, I just think everybody can do better. So every, I need to do better. Everybody needs to do better in some aspect of their life. And it might not have anything to do with HIV because right now, I think people's mental health is real important because that's what all most of my, not all of my clients, but most of them are talking about is that they don't want to call it mental health. They just say, well, you know, how do you know you're depressed? How do you know this? And so I have a counselor who volunteers for me and she goes over like this is, and this is what you can do to combat it. This is what you can do. And she actually, they actually have access to her if they feel like they need to call her off of our Zooms, off of our calls. But we try to approach the whole person. And if I have a lot of other suicidal issues or whatever kind of issues going on, you think I care about HIV? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> totally. Luckily, volunteers are really sustaining this whole work because governments aren't. That's like the, that's the fortunate point. This is my last and signature question. I always love to ask this. Um, is this. Is there a quote or a saying that you live by that you would like to share with us? I don't have time or tea sales to waste. So if you cost me a tea sale, I'll dismiss you. Great. <laughs> I feel this is on point with everything that we've been saying right now. It's great. <laughs> And yeah. a lot of people, all of my, I started this with my family. All of my family know exactly what it means. And everybody's saying, you need to get a t-shirt. You need to make that into a t-shirt. I say, everybody, people who are not HIV positive, a lot of people don't know, don't realize, oh, you have T-cells too. And stress will make the he healthiest person sick. Yeah. <laughs> so True. you have to, but people don't know they have T-cells and they need to know their counts and that, 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 so it's a different thing, but for me, I don't have time to see sales to waste. Oops, sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Time is precious, and I'm really happy I spent it with you having this interview. Thank you again. Really, thank okay, you. Okay, thank. Bye. Thank you so much. When is it gonna? When is it gonna post? We wanted to post it on March fifth. Oh, 5th of okay. March. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, Looking I'll forward look to it. Bye. Oh, thank yeah. you. It was a pleasure.